The Moon Bog by H.B. Lovecraft Read by Mike Bennett Somewhere, to what remote and fearsome region I know not, Dennis Barry has gone. I was with him the last night he lived among men and heard his screams when the thing came to him, but all the peasants and police in County Meath could never find him, or the others, though they searched long and far. And now... I shudder when I hear the frogs piping in swamps or see the moon in lonely places. I had known Dennis Barry well in America, where he had grown rich and had congratulated him when he bought back the old castle by the bog at Sleepy Kildare. It was from Kildare that his father had come, and it was there that he wished to enjoy his wealth among ancestral scenes. Men of his blood had once ruled over Kildare and built and dwelt in the castle, but those days were very remote, so that for generations the castle had been empty and decaying. After he went to Ireland, Barry wrote me often and told me how, under his care, the grey castle was rising tower by tower to its ancient splendour, how the ivy was climbing slowly over the restored walls as it had climbed so many centuries ago, and how the peasants blessed him for bringing back the old days with his gold from over the sea. But in time there came troubles— and the peasants ceased to bless him and fled away as if from a doom. And then he sent a letter and asked me to visit him, for he was lonely in the castle with no one to speak to save the new servants and labourers he had brought from the north. The bog was the cause of all these troubles, as Barry told me the night I came to the castle. I had reached Kildare in the summer sunset, as the gold of the sky lighted the green of the hills and groves and the blue of the bog, where, on a far islet, a strange, olden ruin glistened spectrally. That sunset was very beautiful, but the peasants at Ballyloch had warned me against it and said that Kildare had become accursed, so that I almost shuddered to see the high turrets of the castle gilded with fire— Barry's motor had met me at the Ballyloch station, for Kildare is off the railway. The villagers had shunned the car and the driver from the north, but had whispered to me with pale faces when they saw I was going to Kildare. And that night, after our reunion, Barry told me why. The peasants had gone from Kildare because Dennis Barry was to drain the great bog. For all his love of Ireland, America had not left him untouched, and he hated the beautiful wasted space where peat might be cut and land opened up. The legends and superstitions of Kildare did not move him, and he laughed when the peasants first refused to help, and then cursed him and went away to Ballyloch with their few belongings as they saw his determination. In their place he sent for labourers from the north, and when the servants left, he replaced them likewise. But it was lonely among strangers, so Barry had asked me to come. When I heard the fears which had driven the people from Kildare, I laughed as loudly as my friend had laughed, for these fears were of the vaguest, wildest, and most absurd character. They had to do with some preposterous legend of the bog, and of a grim guardian spirit that dwelt in the strange olden ruin on the far islet I had seen in the sunset. There were tales of dancing lights in the dark of the moon, and of chill winds when the night was warm, of wraiths in white hovering over the waters, and of an imagined city of stone deep down below the swampy surface— but foremost among the weird fancies and alone in its absolute unanimity was that of the curse awaiting him who should dare to touch or drain the vast 
reddish morass. But foremost among the weird fancies, and alone in its absolute unanimity, was that of the curse awaiting him who should dare to touch or drain the vast reddish morass. There were secrets, said the peasants, which must not be uncovered, secrets that had lain hidden since the plague came to the children of Partholan in the fabulous years beyond history. In the Book of Invaders, it is told that these sons of the Greeks were all buried at Tala, but old men in Kildare said that one city was overlooked, save by its patron moon goddess, so that only the wooded hills buried it when the men of Nemed swept down from Scythia in their thirty ships. Such were the idle tales which had made the villagers leave Kildare, and when I heard them I did not wonder that Dennis Barry had refused to listen. He had, however, a great interest in antiquities, and proposed to explore the bog thoroughly when it was drained. The white ruins on the islet he had often visited, but though their age was plainly great and their contour very little like that of most ruins in Ireland, they were too dilapidated to tell the days of their glory. Now the work of drainage was ready to begin, and the labourers from the north were soon to strip the forbidden bog of its green moss and red heather, and kill the tiny shell-paved streamlets and quiet blue pools fringed with rushes. After Barry had told me these things, I was very drowsy, for the travels of the day had been wearying, and my host had talked late into the night. A manservant showed me to my room, which was in a remote tower overlooking the village and the plain at the edge of the bog, and the bog itself, so that I could see from my windows in the moonlight the silent roofs from which the peasants had fled, and which now sheltered the labourers from the north, and, too, the parish church with its antique spire, and far out across the brooding bog, the remote olden ruin on the islet, gleaming white and spectral. Just as I dropped off to sleep, I fancied I heard sounds from the distance, sounds that were wild and half-musical, and stirred me with a weird excitement which coloured my dreams. But when I awakened next morning, I felt it had all been a dream, for the visions I had seen were more wonderful than any sound of wild pipes in the night. Influenced by the legends that Barry had related, my mind had in slumber hovered around a stately city in a green valley, where marble streets and statues, villas and temples, carvings and inscriptions, all spoke in certain tones the glory that was Greece. When I told this dream to Barry, we both laughed, but I laughed the louder because he was perplexed about his labourers from the north. For the sixth time they had all overslept, waking very slowly and dazedly and acting as if they had not rested, although they were known to have gone early to bed the night before. That morning and afternoon I wandered alone through the sun-gilded village and talked now and then with idle labourers, for Barry was busy with final plans for beginning his work of drainage. The labourers were not as happy as they might have been, for most of them seemed uneasy over some dream which they had had, yet which they tried in vain to remember. I told them of my dream, but they were not interested, till I spoke of the weird sounds I thought I had heard. Then they looked oddly at me, and said that they seemed to remember weird sounds too. In the evening, Barry dined with me and announced that he would begin the drainage in two days— I was glad, for although I disliked to see the moss and the heather and the little streams and lakes depart, I had a growing wish to discern the ancient secrets the deep matted peat might hide, and that night my dreams of piping flutes and marble peristyles came to a sudden and disquieting end. 
for upon the city and the valley I saw a pestilence descend, and then a frightful avalanche of wooded slopes that covered the dead bodies in the streets and left unburied only the temple of Artemis on the high peak where the aged moon priestess, Cleus, lay cold and silent with the crown of ivory on her silver head. I have said that I awaked suddenly and in alarm, For some time I could not tell whether I was waking or sleeping, for the sound of flutes still rang shrilly in my ears. But when I saw on the floor the icy moonbeams and the outlines of a latticed Gothic window, I decided I must be awake and in the castle of Kildare. Then I heard a clock from some remote landing far below strike the hour of two, and I knew I was awake. Yet still there came that monotonous piping from afar, wild, weird airs that made me think of some dance of fauns on distant main Alice. It would not let me sleep, and in impatience I sprang up and paced the floor. Only by chance did I go to the north window and look out upon the silent village and the plain at the edge of the bog, I had no wish to gaze abroad, for I wanted to sleep, but the flutes tormented me, and I had to do or see something. How could I have suspected the thing I was to behold? There, in the moonlight that flooded the spacious plain, was a spectacle which no mortal, having seen it, could ever forget. To the sound of reedy pipes that echoed over the bog, there glided silently and eerily a mixed throng of swaying figures, reeling through such a revel as the Sicilians may have danced to Demeter in the old days under the harvest moon beside the Cyane. The wide plain, the golden moonlight, the shadowy moving forms, and above all the shrill, monotonous piping, produced an effect which almost paralysed me. Yet I noted amidst my fear that half of these tireless, mechanical dancers were the labourers whom I had thought asleep, while the other half were strange, airy beings in white, half indeterminate in nature, but suggesting pale, wistful naiads from the haunted fountains of the bog. I do not know how long I gazed at this sight from the lonely turret window before I dropped suddenly in a dreamless swoon out of which the high sun of morning aroused me. My first impulse on awaking was to communicate all my fears and observations to Dennis Barry, But as I saw the sunlight glowing through the latticed east window, I became sure that there was no reality in what I thought I had seen. I am given to strange phantasms, yet am never weak enough to believe in them. So, on this occasion, contented myself with questioning the labourers, who slept very late and recalled nothing of the previous night save misty dreams of shrill sounds— This matter of the spectral piping harassed me greatly, and I wondered if the crickets of autumn had come before their time to vex the night and haunt the visions of men. Later in the day, I watched Barry in the library poring over his plans for the great work which was to begin on the morrow, and for the first time felt a touch of the same kind of fear that had driven the peasants away— For some unknown reason, I dreaded the thought of disturbing the ancient bog and its sunless secrets, and pictured terrible sights lying black under the unmeasured depth of age-old peat. That these secrets should be brought to light seemed injudicious, and I began to wish for an excuse to leave the castle and the village. I went so far as to talk casually to Barry on the subject, but did not dare continue after he gave his resounding laugh. So I was silent when the sun set fulgently over the far hills, and Kildare blazed all red and gold in a flame that seemed like a portent. 
Whether the events of that night were of reality or illusion, I shall never ascertain. Certainly they transcend anything we dream of in nature and the universe, yet in no normal fashion can I explain those disappearances which were known to all men after it was over. I retired early and full of dread, and for a long time could not sleep in the uncanny silence of the tower. It was very dark, for although the sky was clear, the moon was now well in the wane, and would not rise till the small hours, and Kildare blazed all red and gold in a flame that seemed a portent. I thought, as I lay there, of Dennis Barry, and of what would befall that bog when the day came, and found myself almost frantic with an impulse to rush out into the night, take Barry's car, and drive madly to Ballyloch, out of the menaced lands. But before my fears could crystallize into action, I had fallen asleep, and gazed in dreams upon the city and the valley, cold and dead under a shroud of hideous shadow. Probably it was the shrill piping that awaked me, Yet that piping was not what I noticed first when I opened my eyes. I was lying with my back to the east window, overlooking the bog where the waning moon would rise, and therefore expected to see light cast on the opposite wall before me, but I had not looked for such a sight as now appeared. Light indeed glowed on the panels ahead, but it was not any light that the moon gives— Terrible and piercing was the shaft of ruddy refulgence that now streamed through the Gothic window, and the whole chamber was brilliant with a splendour intense and unearthly. My immediate actions were peculiar for such a situation, but it is only in tales that a man does the dramatic and foreseen thing. Instead of looking out across the bog toward the source of the new light— I kept my eyes from the window in panic fear and clumsily drew on my clothing with some dazed idea of escape. I remember seizing my revolver and hat, but before it was over I had lost them both without firing the one or donning the other. After a time the fascination of the red radiance overcame my fright and I crept to the east window and looked out whilst the maddening, incessant piping whined and reverberated through the castle and over all the village. Over the bog was a deluge of flaring light, scarlet and sinister, and pouring from the strange olden ruin on the far islet. The aspect of that ruin I cannot describe— I must have been mad, for it seemed to rise majestic and undecayed, splendid and column-cinctured, the flame reflecting marble of its entrablature, piercing the sky like the apex of a temple on a mountain top. Flutes shrieked and drums began to beat, and as I watched in awe and terror, I thought I saw dark, saltant forms silhouetted grotesquely against the vision of marble and effulgence. The effect was titanic, altogether unthinkable, and I might have stared indefinitely had not the sound of the piping seemed to grow stronger at my left. Trembling, with a terror oddly mixed with ecstasy, I crossed the circular room to the north window, from which I could see the village and the plain at the edge of the bog. There my eyes dilated again, with a wild wonder, as great as if I had not just turned from a scene beyond the pale of nature, for on the ghastly red litten plain was moving a procession of beings in such a manner as none ever saw before, save in nightmares. Half gliding, half floating in the air, the white-clad bog-wraiths were slowly retreating toward the still waters and the island ruin in fantastic formations, suggesting some ancient and solemn ceremonial dance, 
their waving translucent arms, guided by the detestable piping of those unseen flutes, beckoned in uncanny rhythms to a throng of lurching labourers who followed dog-like with blind, brainless, floundering steps as if dragged by a clumsy but resistless demon will. As the naiads neared the bog without altering their course, a new line of stumbling stragglers zigzagged drunkenly out of the castle from some door far below my window, groped sightlessly across the courtyard and through the intervening bit of village, and joined the floundering column of labourers on the plain. Despite their distance below me, I at once knew they were the servants brought from the north, for I recognised the ugly and unwieldy form of the cook, whose very absurdness had now become unutterably tragic. The flutes piped horribly, and again I heard the beating of the drums from the direction of the island ruin. Then, silently and gracefully, the naiads reached the water, and melted one by one into the ancient bog, while the line of followers, never checking their speed, splashed awkwardly after them, and vanished amidst a tiny vortex of unwholesome bubbles which I could barely see in the scarlet light. And as the last pathetic straggler, the fat cook, sank heavily out of sight in that sullen pool, the flutes and the drums grew silent, and the blinding red rays from the ruins snapped instantaneously out, leaving the village of doom lone and desolate in the wan beams of a new-risen moon. My condition was now one of indescribable chaos— not knowing whether I was mad or sane, sleeping or waking, I was saved only by a merciful numbness. I believe I did ridiculous things, such as offering prayers to Artemis, Latona, Demeter, Persephone and Pluton. All that I recalled of a classic youth came to my lips as the horrors of the situation roused my deepest superstitions. I felt that I had witnessed the death of a whole village— and knew I was alone in the castle with Dennis Barry, whose boldness had brought down a doom. As I thought of him, new terrors convulsed me, and I fell to the floor, not fainting, but physically helpless. Then I felt the icy blast from the east window where the moon had risen, and began to hear the shrieks in the castle far below me. Soon those shrieks had attained a magnitude and quality which cannot be written of, and which make me faint as I think of them. All I can say is that they came from something I had known as a friend. At some time during this shocking period, the cold wind and the screaming must have roused me, for my next impression is of racing madly through inky rooms and corridors and out across the courtyard into the hideous night. They found me at dawn, wandering mindless near Ballyloch, but what unhinged me utterly was not any of the horrors I had seen or heard before. What I muttered about as I came slowly out of the shadows was a pair of fantastic incidents which occurred in my flight, incidents of no significance, yet which haunt me unceasingly when I am alone in certain marshy places or in the moonlight. As I fled from that accursed castle along the bog's edge, I heard a new sound, common yet unlike any I had heard before at Kildare, the stagnant waters, lately quite devoid of animal life, now teemed with a horde of slimy, enormous frogs, which piped shrilly and incessantly in tones strangely out of keeping with their size. They glistened, bloated and green in the moonbeams, and seemed to gaze up at the fount of light, 
I followed the gaze of one very fat and ugly frog and saw the second of the things which drove my senses away. Stretching directly from the strange olden ruin on the far islet to the waning moon, my eyes seemed to trace a beam of faint, quivering radiance, having no reflection in the waters of the bog. And upward, along that pallid path, my fevered fancy pictured a thin shadow slowly writhing, a vague, contorted shadow, struggling as if drawn by unseen demons. Crazed as I was, I saw in that awful shadow a monstrous resemblance, a nauseous, unbelievable caricature, a blasphemous effigy of him who had been Dennis Barry. Thank you for listening. The music on the podcast was by The Laughing End. Follow on Twitter at The Laughing End. <laughs>